Hey everyone, in this episode, we'll be mentioning rape and sexual assault, so listener discretion is advised. He had to save two worlds, but he was only one man. Or was he? Today on Dumpster Book Club, we're talking about Tesseract by Joseph Addison. And this book is good. What? It's fine. This book was great. It's great. What? <laughs> I think, what did you what did you even just say? Doesn't matter. This was a book that we picked up a few years ago, along with Probability Man and a few other worse books, if you can imagine. And I've kind of been dreading reading it. (laughs) Do you mean Mute as the worst book? Yes. Okay. (laughs) The worst book I've ever read. And I picked it out based again on the title, hoping for another fun math adventure. Yeah, the cover actually isn't very intriguing compared to a lot of the other ones. It's pretty hideous. But we'll jump for anything with a tesseract in it. Um, (laughs) the colors, it's all pink and orange, but with a kind of medium green. A representation of a tesseract in a light blue. What are we talking about the cover? Yeah, just look at those horrible people. Yeah. This guy looks like Ray Romano with Five O'Clock Shadow. (laughs) (laughs) Also, what's with his green v-neck jumpsuit? That wasn't described in the book. I think, I just imagine they have normal clothes like humans. I think they had to spice up the cover a little bit so you knew. (laughs) Spice it up with a green jumpsuit. Give them both citizen jumpsuits. There's also a few weird creatures on the cover. Imagine... A lion, but it's bald like a sphinx, and no ears, and bipedal. I guess I see that. (laughs) Okay, okay. It looks like an overgrown, muscle bound lemur. (laughs) Yeah, I I can see that too. So you look at the cover and you're. You think, man, that's an ugly alien creature. And then you look slightly to the right and you see the the artist's attempt at drawing a monkey and you realize no it's not really the alien's fault you know what this cover actually reminds me of is it looks strikingly similar to a lot of those terry goodkind covers oh no down to the font of the title and the the poses of him reaching down yeah uh future ray romano is holding on to is holding hands with a I don't have a celebrity to to compare that lady to. Just a lady with pink hair on the steps of some stone monument. Yeah, overall, not an attractive cover. The other reason I had really low expectations for this book is that it seems to be by far the most obscure book that we've reviewed for the podcast. Um, Yeah, but did you see your boy (laughs) is on the reviews? I did! He loved this book. (laughs) If I see (laughs) review one more book that we do, I'm going to contact him and see if he wants to be on the show. No! We should probably just go to for recommendations (laughs) about what to read next. As far as I can tell, this is also the first and only book written by Joseph Addison. Yeah, it says in the back it's his first book. Yeah, but I'm 95% sure that this is a pseudonym (laughs) since there is a historical playwright and essayist with the same name. But did you see in the back Joseph Addison has written plays? Yes. Do you think it's the same guy? (laughs) Or do you think Joseph Addison is a communist committee? (laughs) Um, we should get Philip K. Dick to weigh in on this. I've scoured the internet looking for more information, but it's pretty hard given anything I could find was about the more famous Joseph Addison searching for 
Tesseract as the generic book title didn't help at all. So I do have some conspiracy theories about Joseph Addison, which I think we can come back to at the end. Wait, do you think he's a communist committee? No. Okay. So do you want to get into chapter one? Yeah, I do. I think it's really funny that our main character is Mark Johnson. (laughs) Mark Johnson, the most boring man alive. But (laughs) we'll get to it later. (laughs) What? Just later when they when they call him Mac, (laughs) Mac. (laughs) Okay, well, but right at the beginning, he's some boring pencil pusher. An accountant or something, or... Yeah, and I can see why this book never gained popularity, because the first chapter, and even just the first few pages, was a real struggle to get through. I didn't think so. It went pretty quickly for me. Okay, well, it felt like I was reading the minutes of a a board meeting of an oil company. It was the most inept board meeting possible. (laughs) Every time I tried to read the words, my eyes just glazed over and I'd get to the end of the page and realized I hadn't read anything. Start over. I think this existed before YA was a thing, but I I would definitely, this seems like a children's book almost. Oh, yeah. Um, If you can get through the first few pages, the plot pretty much goes from zero to a (laughs) hundred. And after that, there is no no problem, but it was just so boring. Uh, I I don't actually remember much of the beginning. The book shifts so many times, you almost forget things that happen. And not a lot of them matter. There's a lot of pointless stuff. So... Our hero, Mark Johnson, super boring guy, just struggling to give a presentation at his corporate job, a little budget presentation. But I think I found him to be a pretty relatable character. (laughs) He's kind of got imposter syndrome and feeling like he's kind of faking his way through his job, like he doesn't really belong and trying to fake the confidence to get through this meeting and he gets a call from the the company president that's the point where he feels like things are it's too much it's like a dream but from there we jump right into threats of nuclear war i guess i want to say before that mark is kind of an everyman where the whole time he's just i don't believe this this doesn't seem right this is bad <laughs> Which is, it is fun to just have someone in the book being completely unbelieving of all the ridiculous things that happens, but he's also such a whiner. (laughs) Just whining about everything all the time. Uh, Yes. um, I just wanted to say that, and then we can... Yeah, so he's called to the... He just gets sent to another building. Yes, to meet with Jonathan Tyson, who seems like a an Elon Musk type figure. I don't know. A super rich philan- philanthropist. Is that what a philanthropist is? What's a philanthropist? Yeah, you got it. I study dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's so rich, he bought a block of New York City... And built a giant ugly cube in it. And everyone calls it Tyson's Folly because it's ugly and dumb. Was it ugly or just weird? It was like a big solid black cube building or something. That's kind of ugly. Oh, okay. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Um. He gets to Tyson's Folly, the big black cube. And he meets Tyson, who's an old crazy man who only talks through video screens. And he tells Mark that he wants to take over the world, basically. He has some complicated... Not complicated. This book isn't complicated. (laughs) But he has a plan so that the world can have a single government and leader. And I think he wants the United Nations to take over. And he's going to do this by threatening nuclear war on everyone because he has a billion nuclear warheads. He sets off a few nuclear explosions to... Just to get the message across. 
and he wants Mark to be his envoy to the rest of the world. So from that point, Mark is pretty much stuck at the stuck at Tyson's Folly, which super high tech got a hollow deck stuff like that. He acts like an angsty teenager. And his relationship with Tyson is kind of like that. He's just always whining about everything. And when he gets upset with Tyson, he tells him to go to hell and (laughs) goes back to his room. Um, (laughs) At one point, Tyson calls him my boy and says he's proud of him. And they just have like a weird father-son relationship, except Tyson is the kind of father that can uh, kidnap a woman when he thinks you might need a date. Tyson doesn't want Mark to get lonely in the cube because Mark can't leave because everyone in the world wants to kill him because Tyson is threatening to kill everyone in the world with nuclear bombs and everyone's mad about that for some reason. (laughs) So he just kidnaps a woman, says, here, now you have a friend. Um, So I really like the introduction to Allison. She's like a struggling writer, and in her introductory chapter, she's just furious with her agent over an article she wrote about penguins. I really like Allison as a character, and I thought she pairs well with Mark, and I think my favorite part of this book is their romance. Of all the things in the book, I think their relationship is handled the best and was the most fun thing to read. Yeah. They work well together, their characteristics complement each other, and they're defined enough where you understand both of them and can maybe predict how they would react to certain situations. Yeah, and although initially it seems like she's been kidnapped, find out later that I don't know. How do I say it? I don't know. It's pretty weird how they meet where it's a definite (laughs) weird kidnapping thing. But Allison is pretty clear headed and sort of susses out the situation uh, and determines that she can trust Mark after a while. I just really like their relationship builds and the book shows it instead of tells it. I've read way more famous books that could not build a relationship over time the way this one did. And it does it pretty quickly, but you can see the little stepping stones to when they fall in love, and it feels good. It's nice to read. Yeah, I think something Joseph Addison does really well is just getting some kind of emotional investment in a character very quickly and efficiently. Once... Tyson escalates to destroying cities, you know, starting, starting with Rome to let, let people know he's serious. There's a few unrelated chapters, which just have like a few page long interlude for, um, for other characters. And I, I felt like even those stories had like, I don't know, more emotional depth than like all of Probability (laughs) Man and Hobgoblin put together. Yes, I agree with you, but also I thought those were super dumb and I was very mad that they were in the book. Really? Even the sad cat yeah, story? I thought the sad cat was so dumb. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, okay. We can talk about it now because it it doesn't matter where this comes in. Mm-hmm. Later in the book, Tyson decides to destroy Rome as a show of force, and some guy ends up trapped in Rome with a broken leg, and he's sitting there trying to feed an alley cat, and then they both die. Yep. The end. (laughs) And there's a few little vignettes in the book, and it seems like he's trying to expand the universe. Yeah, I thought the ones later did serve that purpose of kind of creating the setting... Uh, I guess. Once we get into space with future stuff. I don't know. Like, what's everyday life like on this colony ship? (laughs) (laughs) I would have rather expanded on other minor characters in the book that definitely needed expanding than adding these extra non-important characters. There's a few characters that are interesting that really don't get their due, but they're treated as if you know them and care about them as much as you do Mark and Allison and Jonathan Tyson and stuff. Like Evelyn, (laughs) who's also in the cube with them, and she's just a nice old lady. She makes you breakfast. She'll chat with you if you want. (laughs) She's a nice old lady hanging out there with them. 
Evelyn is great. It was also very refreshing to read a book in the same genre as Probability Man and Mute and all these other horrible books we've read. Okay, maybe I shouldn't say it like that because we haven't read those on this. It's fine. Mute is the looming specter of this podcast. (laughs) Maybe someday. Um... We're introduced to Evelyn, and we do not start with a description of how big her boobs are or how dumpy she is. All of her physical description is very secondary or serving to, like, the description of her personality. Mark really likes her right away, which makes sense later, but I don't know. She's just a nice old lady. Yeah, she's just so likable. Wait, when you said that, it reminded me of the physical description of Allison in the beginning. Do you just like Allison because she's like a sweaty nerd that doesn't shower? (laughs) I think I liked her because of how mad she was (laughs) about a penguin article. (laughs) There's also a pet monkey named Elmo. He has no consequence on the story, and he just appears so that the author can say, Elmo's being a funny monkey right now. Oh my god. I'm glad Elmo had as small of a role as he did. (laughs) Um, And that was a huge concern before I started reading this book, because from Mute and other horrible books, a weird animal on the cover... (laughs) is usually a bad sign because they're probably psychic and will talk through the whole book. But Elmo is not psychic. Elmo does talk through the whole book, but it's relentless chattering that Joseph Addison just says. He chatters this whole time. Pretend like there's a monkey being obnoxious in the background of the scene. (laughs) I'm not going to mention it again for another 50 pages. That is so much better than Elmo speaking English to them, which did not happen, thankfully. The last important character is Archer, who is the head of U.S. security or something. He's like a CIA army man, and Mark runs into him a few times when he goes out to communicate with the rest of the world for Jonathan Tyson and give the world John's demands and stuff. Archer seems your typical CIA man. He's trying to sneak Mark a gun and trying to get on the inside and has all these plans. Yeah, trying to get Mark as a double agent or something. It describes him as being super clever and physically fit and just your average Tom Clancy man. And eventually the world does not agree to Jonathan Tyson's demands and Jonathan blows up Rome uh, what else does he blow up? St. Petersburg? Minsk? But he makes sure to let everyone... He lets everyone know he's going to blow up these places so that everyone can evacuate because he's really a good guy down underneath it all. Do you want to get into why he's creating a new world government? Yeah, if Rico will shut up. Okay. Rico. 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 I think it's Ash. That's why. Ash. What are you doing? Oh, you're real stuck. So what, twist number one of this book that you see from the beginning? Well, I didn't have this book figured out because it gets (laughs) real dumb and weird, but you know it's time travel pretty much from page one. Right, so Tyson is trying to save the world from inevitable destruction. I don't know. Tyson's from the future. Okay, the the time travel doesn't make sense in this book to me. (laughs) Because Tyson says he's from a future where the Earth destroys itself, and he has come back in time to stop it from destroying himself. So at this point, it seems like it's one of those dimension time travels where you travel back in time and then you alter it, and it's a different timeline. Yeah. But from here on, the book operates as if it's a loop, where Mark and Tyson operate as if oh, I've already done this and come back in time, so everything I do is pre-programmed. Yeah, but I don't know. I feel like it was simple enough that it didn't didn't distract too much from the story. They, They explain it away that makes sense. It was just frustrating because it flips back and forth between two inconsistent two consistencies where one is we're in a perfect loop and everything I did is going to happen in the future and my future is going to happen in the past 
but there are a few actions where they talk about it as if they're changing the course. Sometimes it operates on back to the future rules, but sometimes it operates <laughs> on, uh, I don't know what primer rules. What's, what's one with alternate dimensions? Um, well, I, mean, I guess Terminator. Well, I think back to the future does have both also. So it, it which, it's just Back to the Future rules, then, yeah, where which, there's no rules. Which don't make sense when you start to look at them, but I really like the discussion about time travel from Looper, where Bruce Willis just yells at you that it doesn't matter. <laughs> the and details aren't too important for this. The details aren't important. The problem is people kept bringing it up and bringing it up in different ways, and that's why it was frustrating. If they uh. had just said, oh, it doesn't matter, or oh, it's this way, or it's this way. But Mark, every once in a while, Mar Mark turns to the camera and says, because time travel, this. And sometimes it's one way, and sometimes it's the other way. And that's the part that's frustrating for me. If they just said time travel, and then we're done with it, it would be fine. I really felt that the explanation devoted to it was pretty minimal. Um, especially when we just read Probability Man, where, like, chapters and chapters are devoted to <laughs> just explanation for things that inherently don't make sense yes okay but here's a question for you okay if there was not any time travel in this book would it be any different yes are you sure are you sure it just wouldn't be a linear story yes okay i'll make this argument again at the end <laughs> okay well I guess the time travel matters because we find out that Jonathan and Evelyn are future Mark and Allison. And them being the same, it's like it changes all the character relationships from the beginning. And just Allison wasn't just a random lady they kidnapped. She was picked because in some timeline... They knew. Wait, no, 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 no. <laughs> you can't bring in okay, the timeline okay, okay, when fine. it's a perfect loop. Well, it's not in some... Okay, but I think they must have met in the timeline where the Earth explodes. Because they, they picked Allison to <laughs> be his buddy because <laughs> they knew that they were going to fall in love. Okay, that's the frustrating part is because... <laughs> Sometimes they say there's different timelines, but other times it's a perfect loop. They meet Allison because Jonathan kidnaps him, and Jonathan is Mark, so Mark knows to kidnap Allison. And that's the only reason Allison is chosen. And that's the that's the description of time travel for most of this book. The alternate timelines is like two or three times, and that's why it's so frustrating. Well, okay. Part of that I just assumed. But you just it made sense <laughs> enough to me when I read it. <laughs> okay. There was also a great scene where there's a sex scene, which I assumed was Mark and Allison. Oh, yeah. I thought that was pretty clever. But it doesn't... Because it, we just had a chapter about Mark and Allison. Next chapter starts with a real steamy scene where it doesn't say who they are, but... At the end of it, you realize it was Jonathan and Evelyn, mm -hmm. but they are Mark and Allison. Yeah. Um, this actually isn't very shocking in the book because you also know this as soon as you meet Jonathan Tyson. <laughs> it's not a shocking reveal. It's very obvious that Jonathan Tyson is Mark from the future. <laughs> um, it's a little bit less obvious that Evelyn is Allison, but... Also, that scene was great because it had the word sensual surfers. <laughs> I remember reading that and thinking Mimi was going to mention this specific word on the podcast. Well, you want to talk about Tesseract? Yeah, so how does Jonathan know how to go back in time? Because there is this god being the Tesseract. The Tesseract is not actually a Tesseract or any weird mathematical concept or even a structure that they're within that looks like a Tesseract. Tesseract is just a... AI from another planet that can travel back and forth in time. Though I've talked shit about the time travel in this book, this is the part that makes it okay, because they straight up say that the Tesseract is a god, and the Tesseract is the one doing all this, so if the Tesseract wants this to be this way and time travel to go this way, fine. 
Anyway, the Tesseract is an artificial intelligence from another planet that can travel back and forth in time and for some reason needs to save humanity so that humanity can save the people of his planet. And so he's manipulating Jonathan Tyson slash Mark Johnson to alter Earth's timeline so that humanity can reach the planet and save whatever the AI wants to save. Tesseract can also teleport things around. So all the nuclear explosions, there's no radiation or something because it's just teleporting some of the sun to the surface of the Earth for a second. (laughs) Um, One of the things I liked about Tesseract was that it seems like when it was created, it had some kind of rules of robotics, but a variation on it where the Tesseract isn't able to destroy unless its planet is threatened, and then it kind of bends those rules a little bit so that uh, technically they're being threatened by themselves, so I'm gonna... It's fine if I go blow up things on (laughs) Earth. Eventually, Mark comes to accept that he's Jonathan enough, and Allison is totally accepting pretty quickly. And the Tesseract teleports Mark to the future, where we meet the two other main characters of the book, Sam Warren and Jaheel. Sam Warren was just an executive at the company Mark used to work at, used to work at, and is kind of assigned governor of the world. Just a general good guy, Sam. (laughs) And... Jaheel was like a resistance fighter against the new government, I thought. Or? Yeah, Jaheel is a resistance fighter against the world government that Jonathan has set up. The Anyway, the Tesseract has transported Mark 20 or 30 years in the future after the world government is already set. And Sam is already solid governor and has also finished a great project of building an interstellar spaceship. And it is about to launch. Future Mark has given Sam the instructions to put Archer, our CIA Tom Clancy man, who was originally fighting Mark, and Jaheel, who is a resistance fighter, on the ship. And the ship launches, and Sam's an old happy man, and then that's the end of this part. So after that, or... Next. <laughs> we get we get a quick little chapter on board the spaceship, which is Tyson's Arrow, is what it's called, because everything's got to have, like, a Tyson name. Another useless chapter with a stranger we never see again. Yeah, um, most of that is just fluff. It's fine. Read about this guy's marital problems. Yeah. <laughs> the struggles of... It could have spent this time... With Archer and Jaheel on the ship, expanding their character and explaining why they turn into crazy psychos for the rest of the book. I think we got a little bit of that in Archer's character from the beginning. It was kind of hinted that he was like, even though he wasn't really showing it, there was like this hint that he was just really power hungry. I didn't really (laughs) pick up on that, but I guess, I guess look at us now. (laughs) (coughs) But we did get some of the interactions between Archer and Jaheel on the ship and their plots to take over the new world. Yeah, it was already full bore, though. Archer assassinates the captain of the ship so that he can be the captain. Apparently, he was next in in line to be captain. It's just insane. Why would you want to be the captain of a ship? I just don't understand his motivation. What does the captain get that he doesn't? He just wants to sit at the helm, tell (laughs) Jordy to make it so? (laughs) Yeah, he just wants the glory and power, I guess. I mean, Archer was kind of, he's kind of a boring character. Maybe Uh. I just don't understand, especially in this context, the desire for power. He just wants the power because it is. It has no consequence on Earth. Where everything I'm assuming he cares about is, or anyone cares about. I mean, it matters when they arrive on the other planet of Aos and start colonizing, because he's basically the the king of the world there. Even then, 
so what? He's well, the king of the colony. Yeah, I mean, he's a bad guy. He's got bad motivations. It just doesn't make... I guess there were people like that in our history. I don't know. I don't yeah. understand the motivation to control something. But I guess people have it. It always <laughs> just seemed in the context of getting rich in your own land or something. I'm going to go colonize this planet so I can take the money back to Earth where I can use that money for something instead of, I just want to colonize this planet so I'm king of the planet. Yeah, that's all he really wants, though. Um, Maybe it's just a motivation I can't understand. Yeah, because we would be the good guys. <laughs> we would be that one guy who broke his leg trying to get out of Rome <laughs> and just feeding a cat until we die. Yeah. <sighs> Anyway, in the final part, Tesseract jumps both Mark and Allison on Aos. That's um, how I was going to pronounce it, but I wasn't sure if it's like Ace. Oh. Or Ias. Uh, there's a lot of vowels here. It looks like Aos to me. Just call it Anus for short. No! <laughs> Don't call it that! <laughs> um... So, Mark and Allison are exploring this new world. Wait. Oh. But you skipped the spaghetti slug cows, which oh, were one of the best parts of the book. Oh, that's right. They're not teleported to the planet. They're teleported on a moving creature, which is described as a bison that is <laughs> the length of a football field, and it is made of squiggling squiggly white spaghetti was it really that big it was so it was long like... they couldn't see the edge of it oh that's right i thought it was like mattress sized no and it didn't even make sense that they couldn't see the edge of it with how big it was i think they, they just... thought they were on a plane of spaghetti i think they just weren't really looking very hard just... i liked all the baby spaghettis <coughs> all the little ones i don't remember the little spaghettis well there were baby ones yeah. behind the pack. Yeah. They're just well, like a, a bunch of... What a great creature. Yes. Um, and it turns out Elmo wasn't an earth monkey at all. He was an Aos monkey. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> um, so, yeah, they explore the planet, explore the spaghettis. And eventually they meet Tau. I'm going to pronounce it Tau. Oh, yeah. Who they save from a Sarlacc. <laughs> yeah. And then because they save Tau from a Sarlacc, they're heroes to these aliens, which is what that horrible monster is on the front of the book. And actually in the book, the description kind of fits this yeah. <laughs> art on the front I of the I was cover. shocked. The artist somehow got it spot on. And Tau takes them to a city full of these horrible little critters that all just yell all the time. <laughs> so you have to imagine both Elmo screaming and chattering for the whole book, and then thousands of these horrible little monsters also just... <laughs> <laughs> um, they meet the leader of these aliens. First they meet Sorensen. Oh, yeah. Who's a bad guy, and he's just kind of a lame, evil dude. Yeah, he guides them around the city since... Just wholly unnecessary as a character. The whole book would have moved fine without him. Yeah. Sorry, Sorensen is a human One of the from colonists. the colony ship. Mark and Allison have moved forward in time as well as reached the planet. And the spaceship has landed and successfully colonized the planet. Yeah, just Vadison doesn't waste our time. Gets right to... The good stuff. Gets right to the spaghetti cows. <laughs> um, so yeah, Sorensen introduces them to the leader of the city. They do some kind of drug ritual that makes them part of their society. They get real high together. So then it kind of switches back and forth between Mark and Allison and Archer and Jaheel. There's a whole chapter that's just Jaheel? Maybe not. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's not a... This is the point in the book where I was loving this book. I was having a great time, and then it gets bad. Super disappointing. It was just so sudden and so drastic 
I thought maybe is a different author. Maybe a different person in this communist <laughs> committee took over or everyone was taking a lunch break and two guys went in their own direction. But <clears throat> the humans are enslaving these aliens because the aliens are super compliant. Yes. Um, they don't really understand struggle or strife. So if you just ask them to do something, they'll do it for you. But that doesn't stop humans from being cruel to them because they can. They're like the Thermians from Galaxy Quest. They don't understand the concept of a lie yet. It's very naive and want to make people happy. <clears throat> so the humans have enslaved these creatures and go on slave capturing raids and Jahil tells us about how when she was a child and Tyson's armed forces came to her house and raped her, her brother, and her mother and killed both her brother and mother in this really brutal gang rape scene. And then yep. she sexually assaults this young male officer and just all of a sudden... It's a super dark book, and we're dealing with these themes of occupying forces in other countries, enforcing peace, and slavery, and I didn't want to be here. I just wanted yeah. to go on a fun adventure with Allison and Mark. Um, yes. It's like Jahil has this traumatic backstory, and then... Her way of coping with that is just all she wants is to, like, humiliate others and have power over them. So it gave her more character motivation than Archer. Like, she made a little bit more sense and had a little bit more... Sim but why okay, even yeah. have it? <laughs> it, it? Okay. I don't... Yes. So at this point... In the book, we Jonathan's plan to unite the world was already successful, and we are blissfully believing that there is world peace, and there's no reason for us not to. The book's been super light, and not to in the nitty-gritty politics of everything, and then all of a sudden, there's like strife and turmoil underneath all this, but it's not, they don't actually go into detail of it, it's just, I don't know, it just underlies the whole thing with all of a sudden it's not, like, maybe Jonathan's thing isn't what's right for Earth. And then humanity comes here and are enslaving people and... I mean, Jonathan's plan wasn't... It did involve global war and it wasn't a perfect solution. It was basically just... Let's prevent the complete destruction of Earth. Well, yeah, but it was always in such big, broad, bright strokes. They never focused on any darker politics or really was that realistic ever. I don't understand why all of a sudden for this character to have a tortured past, it has to create this, I don't know, darker side of the whole plot up until now. Yeah. Well, do you want to talk about the power crystals? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the aliens on this planet harvest these power crystals that are super powerful. They could power a spaceship with just one the size of your fist. And Archer and Jaheel have to have them. Yeah, they want to have them so that they can blow up any other ships that come here so Archer can stay king of this planet. Which doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and Jaheel is plotting against Archer so she can be king of the planet. Yeah. Um, and they find out Mark and Allison already have an invite to the secret place where all these power cubes are taken. The aliens take power cubes to the old one who lives on top of a mountain, who is obviously the Tesseract. <laughs> and Jaheel and Archer are going to intercept them, and Sorensen is their sleeper agent with them, and they're going to take all these power crystals from the Great Old One. So, of course, Sorensen betrays Mark and Allison on their journey to the Old One. Um, but with the help of Tao, they find a shortcut, and along the way... Mark teaches Tao how to kill. 
yeah, Mark finds this race of people that are all generally helpful to each other and learn to work in harmony and thinks, wow, you guys don't know about war. Let me let me teach you some things. <laughs> yeah, let me show you this cool thing. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine. Mark's kind of dumb. Yeah, I mean, he had he had good intentions. He was trying to get the aliens to defend themselves against slavery. And meanwhile, Archer and Jaheel have their fight, their duel to the death. Oh, yeah. On, on their journey to meet up with Sorensen, I think during their final fight while I was reading it, I made a lot of sounds out loud. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't enough for them to just brawl or no. Jaheel knocks Archer to the side of the cliff and stomping on his feet. She stomps on his feet, but to pin him so he can't even let go and then takes like a blowtorch and slowly burns up his face and eyelid. And it goes into way too much detail about how yeah. his eyelid gets burned away and, and his like eyeball boils. Bubbling skin. Oh my god. It was <laughs> this scene came out of nowhere. There was like that it's that those two guys in the committee. <laughs> but eventually cr- Archer hits her in the brain with a a rock and she falls off and he climbs up and it spends a lot of time describing all her broken bones and body on the foot on the on the rocks but he's alive as a super scary villain (laughs) just horribly injured for his pretty anticlimactic fight final fight with mark and allison yep yeah, Mark and Allison reach the Tesseract, and the Tesseract... It reveals everything and answers all their questions. Then Archer shows up, and Tesseract deals with it for them. Yes, Tesseract's just, blammo, you're the bad guy. <laughs> but there was a weird moment where it talks about how Archer can't see Tesseract because he's evil, because evil can't look upon itself. Oh. It was just so weird and out of nowhere. Because Archer never seemed, well, until the third part of the book, he didn't seem evil. He just seemed kind of like a shitty guy. And then he turned into an evil slaver because the rest of the committee went out to lunch. And then, why can't... Yeah, that was a little weird. Part of it was that Mark is finally accepting his future role as Tyson from his past. But Mark was able to see Tesseract before that. And it, it wasn't that Archer was evil, just he can't accept who he is or face himself. I guess. I don't know. It was just weird and... Okay, well, good thing they didn't spend too much time <laughs> on it. Archer just blows up. And the Tesseract's grand plan is that these aliens were the ones who built Tesseract, but they had stagnated because they were too peaceful. They had a, a big old city with shopping malls and street signs but it's all covered with jungle because they just stopped using the shopping mall i guess well i guess when you are in bliss there's no reason to go to the mall (laughs) yeah um and so the tesseract's plan was to save humanity and bring humanity to this planet because humanity is shitty and humanity's gonna be shitty on this planet and introduce a bunch of strife to these aliens and the aliens will have to come out of their peaceful happy stupor we'll have to learn how to fight and kill so that they can have a little bit of adversity to overcome yeah and it just makes me so mad because it's this book was so much fun and so great and then all of a sudden these happy aliens have to have adversity why can't being happy and good to each other be the pinnacle of society why do you have to be a military power well, and why does, why couldn't the bad guy have just been some aliens that were attacking this other planet that only Mark could stop because he was really good at banking or, <laughs> <laughs> or some plague that he would have the cure to or something? Why does it have to be human strife and slavery and adversity? Uh, yeah, I think Tesseract just didn't like how dumb they were but uh it just could have been so much more fun yeah 
The ending was also a little bit anticlimactic because for Mark and Allison, the end happens in the middle of the book. And we... Yeah, Mark and Allison didn't actually do anything. Just humanity had to get there. And Archer Uh, had to be there to cause it to make the colony shitty. Well, no, because I think Mark and Allison had to teach... Oh, Mark had to teach that little guy about war. Well, and then, like, they... They stay on the planet while they grow old to kind of lead the rebellion yeah. against the human colony that Tesseract brought there. Which is, that's a good thing. That's what Tesseract wanted. <laughs> yep. Um, and then Mark and Allison go back to be Tyson and Evelyn and, and die. And save humanity yeah. on Earth. Right. <laughs> okay but now that we've gone through the whole thing okay i want to pause at this time travel thing again so what if there was no time travel what if tesseract just came to earth and said hey i've got problems here earth needs to get its shit together be peaceful <laughs> make a spaceship and get over here and then mark and allison are the tools that tesseract uses and then mark and allison fly to the planet and solve the problem would it be that much different Uh, time travel doesn't fit in the plot it only fits in the character motivations and the character development the plot doesn't need the time travel at all uh i don't know i didn't mind the time travel as much as you did obviously it just didn't affect the narrative well i don't know i It seemed like there was some emotional moments where Evelyn knows the exact moment and of her own death and has to still face that. And well, then why not make the book about that? It kind of was. I feel like those all that was like, I feel like that was more central to the book than sort of the like, I, I there wasn't too much time invested in the time travel. It, it tried to make that with the Tesseract forcing you to face yourself and stuff, but it really wasn't. It was about causing Whoa. these aliens to suffer. I think with the time loop thing, the peak of this book happened in like part two or three. <laughs> um, I guess all that does work because it's all so obvious that you know. You figure out all the twists and turns way ahead so you can extrapolate and understand the struggles of the characters when things are happening instead of when it's revealed to you Uh tell me your conspiracy theory okay well there's the one that joseph addison is a committee (laughs) um which would explain the completely different tone of the various parts joseph addison is a time traveler and is the historical (laughs) essayist and playwright. Oh, that's why he knows how time travel works and the time travel is so accurate. Um, Joseph Addison might be the pseudonym for another writer who was embarrassed to put their name to this horrible cover sci-fi novel. I could see that because it does read a little bit as a better writer trying to write a simplistic B sci-fi story. Yeah, if this is a first novel, that's pretty good. Maybe a ghostwriter. Or just a work-for-hire journalist or something got paid by Del Rey. Del Rey just needed to beef up their catalog or something because it it hits all the points kind of in sequence. It has the power fantasy rich guy saving the world. It has some spaceships flying around it's got the time travel loops got weird aliens it sort of just hits all the b sci-fi points very effectively and efficiently um and then the one that i think is most likely is that joseph addison might be a female writer and i think that allison is the self-insert character because allison is a struggling writer who was trying to write novels but just couldn't break into the industry. <laughs> Joe <Joseph> Bass is <laughs> writing about penguins. Yeah. Um I guess 
I mean, the book has, like, a female co-protagonist, a female mentor, a female villain, and every leader on Eos is also female. There's, like, the the monk and the city leader, but they don't dwell on those. Maybe, but what about the totally inappropriate introduction of sexual assault and rape in an um, otherwise totally fun story? Okay, it definitely wasn't necessary in the book, but in a lot of similar genre books, it's either like glorified or glossed over here it at least gave like a motivation to this character it was very brief mention of it and it was just the tonal shift was too much for me to think that someone actually thought through this we may never know the secret of joseph addison well do you have any other thoughts about tesseract No, really, there's not much to think about. (laughs) Even with the one extreme tone shift and the inconsistencies, a pretty light, fine novel. A solid sci-fi adventure. Who do you think this book is for? I didn't think about this beforehand. (laughs) Maybe you should answer first. Who do you think this book is for? Our friend. (laughs) No. Poor um, you didn't think about it either. <laughs> no. Okay. This book is pretty light and fun. This one could be for someone who wants to start reading B sci-fi books and bargain bin stuff. This is a good <laughs> introduction to the bargain bin section of science fiction. Yes. When I pick up a book with a ridiculous cover, this is like the best case scenario. This is exactly what I want from that book. Including a ridiculous tone shift that doesn't make any (laughs) sense and you're just shocked and appalled. Yeah. I think I would have loved this book as a kid, though that final fight scene would have given me nightmares. (laughs) (laughs) Well, a good kid's book sometimes does give you nightmares. Yeah, a little bit of graphic horror builds character (laughs) there's always one there's always one book you read way before you're supposed to and it just scars you for the rest of your life (laughs) do you know what book scarred you as a kid journey to the center of the earth really (sighs) i just read that recently what's the scary part Mostly just the thought of facing your own death alone in the dark, (laughs) thousands of miles from any other human being. Yeah, I guess that's kind of (laughs) scary. I guess for me it's probably The Shining, which is a pretty typical. A lot of kids read Stephen King a little bit too young, and he's got a lot of weird sex stuff. (laughs) Yeah. And The Shining's got a lot of talk of this little kid's pecker. Oh, no. Just talking about a baby dick (laughs) really (laughs) made me uncomfortable as a child. Oh. Anyway, I guess that's it for Tesseract. If you want to join us in December, we are reading Next Stop, The Stars by Robert Silverberg. Great job.